Well, welcome to Fur Road on the last Sunday of 2018. Um, can you believe it already? It goes fast, doesn't it? I, I hope everyone had a good Christmas. Um, glad you've joined us here today. It's Family Sunday also, so we have some of our younger people in here today. So we're glad to have you guys in here. Um, believe it or not, I was uh, Friday night in San Antonio uh, this week. And so we went down to watch Iowa State play in the Alamo Bowl, and unfortunately it did not turn out the way we wanted it to. They lost 28 to 26, and it was one of those that they, uh, I can hardly talk about it. They, so they, they made some mistakes, they, we had seven false starts and three turnovers, but the refs were terrible, uh, they really were, <laughs> made the difference in the game, but um, we started our, our seats, uh, they were through Caleb, their student tickets, they could get a discount. We got there to the game, and we were up in this upper corner, and they had put some special banners for the Alamo Bowl, it was in the Alamo Dome, and we sat down and, and we're like, we're behind this banner, <laughs> we can only see half the field, so uh, we found some other seats that that nobody w- had taken, so we, we had good seats after that. But we had fun as a family, and I hope you guys had some, some good family times in the last uh, week and, and uh, had a great Christmas together. Um, let me say this to start with. How many of you are, uh, you're ready for a new year? Like, you thought 2018 would never end. Like, it was a hard year. Raise your hand if I... That was the case. Okay, several of you. Um, how many of you are like, man, it was a pretty good year. I, I, I wish it would just keep going, you know? Yeah? Um, some, how about, you know, it was just like any other year. It was okay. There's good and bad. Is that some, yeah, probably a lot of you are in that category. Um, any way you look at it, 2019 is coming. And uh, some of you this coming year will have a good year. Some of you will have some tough stuff to deal with. It, um, there's just a, there's a lot of things that are they're out of our control, uh, and there are a lot of things that we can control. and And so what we want to do is kind of do the best with the things we can control. One of the things that we can control is our 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 commitment to serving God this coming year. Right? We can control that. And so for the last five years, I've done a sermon called what's your word to kind of lead into the new year and i've i've encouraged everyone to come up with a word that they're going to kind of have as a uh, their key word for the year there's something they're going to work on or a theme word and you guys have come up with some really great words some of you have really done well with that uh you you kind of worked on that throughout the year some of you come up with a word and you never think about it again for the rest of the year and that's okay too um but we're going to to do a similar thing this year but i'm going to change it a little bit i'm actually maybe upping the ante a little bit for 2019 instead of challenging you to pick a word this year i'm challenging you to pick an action okay so you guys you're on board with me all right it's an action okay so um um we're going to ask you guys, what is something that you're going to try to specifically do this year, okay, to put your faith in action? You see, I think we, we often think of faith as just a noun, okay? It's, it's the things we believe. It's our belief in Jesus. It's our, our personal acceptance of God. Um, you know, our faith is a thing. But I think, to be honest, faith should also be a verb, Okay, faith should be an action word, and faith should be a kind of a combination of our belief and our actions. And the book of James makes that abundantly clear to us. And so faith in God was never meant to just be a mental thing. And we're going to see that faith was always meant to be a whole life thing. Okay, and so... We're going to read a passage in James and, 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 and talk about this passage. And, and, and as we talk this morning, I want you to begin to kind of think about and shape in your mind, okay, wh- what is my action going to be? What is something I'm really going to try to focus on this year? And so let's read James chapter 2, and we'll read quite a few verses here. I think we just really need to kind of put it all out there. James two fourteen through 26 it says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters... If someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? 
Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But some will say, um, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Okay, James doesn't really mess around, does he? Okay, he he just says it like it is. And and I really like the book of James because it's so practical and, and... you know, he's also not afraid to step on some toes, right? And and that's okay sometimes. I think sometimes we need our toes stepped on. Um, And so some have tried to say that James is actually saying that we aren't saved by faith alone. And he's going against what Paul said. And and I don't think that's what what he's saying. I think he's saying that if you, you have no actions to back your faith, then you really had no faith in the first place. You see the difference there? Um you know, it wasn't a real faith to begin with. And, and personally, I think this is still an issue, a huge issue in Christianity today, just like it was in the early church that James was talking about. Martin Luther said this, that people are just about justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. I, I like that statement. Um, so as we, begin, as we begin to think about what's going to look like to, to put our faith into action, I, I want to go through a few nuts and bolts of an act of faith. You can follow along on the back of your bulletins if you'd like to. Nut and bolt number one, no action equals no faith. Real faith equals real action. Okay, our, our, our works don't save us, okay? But, but we are saved to do good works. Okay, our, our salvation should lead to service. And it isn't just a matter of just doing enough to, to squeak by, right? The, the stuff we do for God should be just a kind of a natural result of our faith. It should be who we are. Because God's love overflows to us, we want our love from God to overflow to others. It's just a natural thing. One of the things that has been a result of Faith that hasn't led to action is kind of a, a consumer mindset when it comes to going to church. Okay, you know what? A lot of people kind of go into a church. Okay, what does this church have to offer me? How how many programs does this church have? How how can this church serve me? Do you see how the the focus is kind of wrong there? And, and many churches, I think, have, have bought into that, and and it's like, okay, we have to do everything we can to be the biggest and the best, and we got to have the most programs and the most things to offer people. But I also think a lot of churches are starting to realize that it isn't just about being the biggest and the best and having the most programs, okay? It's it's about figuring out, okay, how does God want to use this particular church to help further the kingdom? And that is something I hope we can just keep refining at Fur Road as we go into 2019 and as we move forward as a church. How does God want to best use Fur Road to help further the kingdom? And so the right question, I think, to ask when going to a church is, you know, hey, what, what do I have to offer this church? How can God use me? And that's, that's wherever we're at, whether it's at church or at our job. We're like, okay, God, how, how are you going to use me this week? And, and we need to keep asking that question. So no actions equals no faith. Real faith equals real action. And then nut and bolt number two, uh, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. Verse 15 again says, Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Okay, we, we, all, people, we all know people that kind of talk a good game when it comes to their faith. And they know how to say all the right things. They, they basically kind of tell people what they want to hear. Uh, I knew a, a minister uh, who was always saying, 
hey, let me know if I can help you with anything. Let, let me know if you need anything. And, and, uh, but when it came to, down to actually helping, it seemed like he often found a way not to help. And, and it just didn't seem to match. Um, I, I hope my, my actions match what I say. We can't just say it. We have to live it and do it. There was a, a young boy. He went on an errand for his mother, and he bought a dozen eggs, and he walked out, out of the store, and he tripped and, and dropped his sack, and all the eggs broke. The sidewalk was a mess, and, and the boy tried not to cry, and, and a few people, they gathered to see if he was okay and to tell him how sorry they were. Sorry you dropped your eggs. Um, but then in the mix of, of this, these these people trying to comfort him. One man handed the boy a quarter and he turned to the group and said, you know, I care 25 cents worth. How much do the rest of you care? So he's saying, hey, let's, let's get this boy some new eggs. Uh, and, and, and so that's just a, a small example of, of what it looks like. Okay, sometimes we just say, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, what are you going to do about it? He actually helped the boy. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about. What, what does it look like to put our faith into action? Talk is cheap. Nut and bolt number three. Neither faith nor works can stand alone. Okay, look at 18 and 19 again. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that, and shudder. Okay, there, there are some that seem to say, I believe in God, okay, I'm saved, that, that's, that's all I need to do. And I say that, you know, that kind of cheapens God's grace when we do that. It's like kind of doing the minimum that you need to do at work. You get the job done, but it's, it's not done well. Um, I used to ask my kids to, to clean their rooms, and they would go back and you know, two minutes later, they would come out and say, okay, I cleaned my rooms. And, and so I'd say, I'd, I realized I have to ask another question. Did you clean it to your standards or to my standards, right? Any parents, you kind of been there? And, and so usually that meant they'd have to go back and, and clean the room again. Um, I just heard about one of my nephews that was asked to clean his room recently, and he um, did the old push everything under your bed trick. <laughs> And so later they discovered that that's how he cleaned his room. Um, when we're following God, we should want to follow Him to the, the very highest of standards that we can, right? Not just a, oh, I'm just going to do enough to get by, or, you know, it's not that big a deal. Man, we, it, we should say, man, I want to serve God. Not out of obligation, but out of love and joy and faithfulness. You know, faith by itself, it's, it says it's dead. It says even Satan believes in God. You know, Satan, he knows God exists, right? And, and he rebelled against God, and, and he's scared to death. He, he knows that, that he has no power over God. Now, on the other side of the equation, you have works, right? You know, what if someone is just basically a pretty good person, and, and they do a lot of nice things for people? What if the person says, you know what, I don't, really believe in God I just I do good things because it's you know a good thing to do and if there's a God hopefully he'll see that you know I'm a, a pretty good person and you hear that a lot today you know well they're I mean they're a good person and so I guess the question then is how, how do you decide what's good enough right I mean who gets to decide if you're good enough is there a scale that that measures things and you put all your good stuff on one side and and your bad stuff on the other side and hopefully the good stuff outweighs the bad no oh. I, I mean i know personally i'd be in trouble if it was the that way my bad side would would outweigh the good side and so it doesn't work like that isaiah 64 6 says this all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our r righteous acts are like filthy rags. we all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away Another kind of step on your toes kind of verse, but basically it's saying that the, the good stuff that we do, it, it's just like a bunch of dirty rags compared to what God has done for us. And so those dirty rags, they, they don't save us. But the cool thing is that God will use those dirty rags if we let him. 
to say, God, I, I, I don't know much to give you. I, I know I make a lot of mistakes, but here it is. I'm, I'm giving it to you. Um, and those dirty rags, they go hand in hand with our faith. There was an old uh, bo- boatman, and he painted the words faith on one side of his, one oar of his boat, and, and works on the other side. And he, he kind of explained it like this. He, he, uh, he started rowing the oar that said faith on it, just, just that oar out in the water. And, and the boat kind of went in a circle, right? Um, and so then he uh, did it with the other side, the, the oar that said works on it. And he just started rowing that side. And it went in a circle the other way. And so then he explained it like this. Um, the oar marked works was put in place... Uh, um, let's see he said this um, to make a passage across the lake one needs both oars working simultaneously in order to keep the boat in a straight and narrow way if one does not have the use of both oars he makes no progress either across the lake nor as a Christian okay you see that's a good illustration to think about okay they they need to work together faith and works and then we have nut and bolt number four. Look to the example of others. Okay, the, the Bible is rich with examples uh, of faith in action. Hebrews 11 is often called the great faith chapter of the Bible. And the, the people that it talks about uh, are, are included, you know, are, they're kind of a faith hall of fame. There's, if you look through that, read through that chapter, you see all these people. Um, you take Abraham. You know, he was referred to in our James passage as an example that, um, you know, we all remember that example. And, and he stepped out on, uh, on faith many times, right? The story of Abraham, he trusted God that he was going to take care of him. And, and no more than the time when God said, I want you to sacrifice your son, Isaac. And, and he trusted that, that God had somehow had a plan for this. Can you imagine, those are your parents, just to say, God... Uh, God says, uh, I want you to sacrifice your son. And of course, you know, you remember the story, God intervened and, and there was a, a ram stuck in a thicket to, to sacrifice instead of his son. And Abraham, he didn't know the outcome of what he was going to do, but he did it in a way. He tr- anyway, he trusted God. So let's look at verse 21 and 22 again. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. Okay, that's a great description of what we're talking about today. His faith and his actions went hand in hand. They, they worked together. And it isn't just Bible stories. There, there are so many people throughout history who have lived out their faith in amazing ways. Who were some examples? Like you guys, could we could go around and say, man, this person, I really look up to them um, because of the, the way they've lived out their faith. Maybe it's a relative or a friend or a, a missionary or, or a Sunday school teacher. Uh, a lot of my heroes of the faith tend to be missionaries. Uh, I like to, to read about them and, and just see how they've kind of sacrificed so much to, to follow Jesus. And there's, there's this one missionary family who has been serving the Lord for over a hundred years now um, through them and then generations down. And it started with a man named J. Russell Morse and his wife Gertrude. And I want to tell you just a little bit about their story. It would take uh, all morning to tell everything. Um, But while attending Phillips University in Enid, Oklahoma, uh, it's just a few hours from here, they attended a meeting held by a medical missionary named Dr. Albert Shelton. And he gave an impassioned plea for missionary recruits to join him in the work at Tibet's border. And they sensed God's leading. And so they said, okay, we're going to go. They made plans to join him. And they left on a ship with their their four-month-old son and and other new missionary recruits for Southeast Asia on August 13, 1921. And once arriving in Vietnam, they traveled on foot for more than 80 days traveling through very treacherous mountain passes with some mountain peaks more than 15,000 feet high. And, and they finally arrived at their mission station on December 23, 1921. Tragically, just a couple months later, um, Dr. Shelton, who you know had 
uh, encouraged them to go. He was shot by bandits while returning home from a medical trip. J. Russell Morris was at his side when he died, and before he died, he told him to hold the fort and carry on the work. And so at age 24, Morris inherited a mission that, that only God's guidance and power and provision could sustain. The next few years were, were really tough. Uh, they, they faced bandits and diseases and, and great spiritual warfare, but they persisted in, in uh, preaching the gospel in remote areas, often where the gospel had never been shared before. And then in the years ahead, that this group that they were working with, the Lisu people, they started to become very receptive to the gospel. And, and, and many people came to Christ, and dozens of churches were started. Um, and like I said, there's been whole books written about this family. Um, but in 1951 then, Morse was arrested by the communist government in China. And the rest of the family got out just in time. But he stayed back to help people, and, and he was in prison for about 15 months, and he was often tortured and uh, persecuted, but finally he was released. Okay, he, And to make a long story short, he went back to the States for a while after that to kind of recover, but then said, i got to go back. And so he went back to the mission field. This time he started a new work in Burma, and it was called the North Burma Christian Mission. And during the next 15 years that they were there, tens of thousands of people came to Christ. Okay, in 1965, Burma made an order that all foreigners had to leave the country. Um, and so they, instead of leaving the country, they fled to the mountains in Burma. And they would see very few outsiders for the next six years. But people in the mountain villages where they were at, uh, started responding to, to Christ. And thousands of mountain people became Christians. You know, you start to see a pattern here, don't you? Okay, they, they never gave up their faith and their action. They just went hand in hand. Eventually, the, the Burmese government released the family um, after being arrested. Okay, so they arrested them all. They're released after three months. And they, they went into Thailand. Uh, it was just right next to there, and they continued their work. And they discovered many tribes there who didn't ever hear about Jesus before. And, and, and people continue to respond to Christ. And, and so they just continued. One thing after, you know, they'd have these obstacles and, and terrible, heartbreaking things. And they just kept saying, no, we're, we're going to keep serving. And, and their, their children and many grandchildren, and now even some great-grandchildren. Uh, hundreds of other missionaries have been inspired to carry on the work of J. Russell Morris and his wife Gertrude. Um, and it's just an incredible story. Uh, Ted and Bev Skiles, who have now been in Taiwan in January, it'll be 50 years that they've been in Taiwan. They were influenced by the Morris family. And, and they would say, hey, they, they were people that we looked up to. And ended up going to the mission field. So there's just so many people down the line because of this one family who was so persistent and saying we, people need to know about Jesus. And, and so I look to, to families like that and I think, man, that's so awesome. And it inspires me you know, to do what I can here um, to help further the kingdom. Um, and I think it's important to look up to people. Um, realize they aren't perfect, Right? They're people. They make mistakes. And, um, but just look at the way they've lived out their faith in Christ. In fact, we can use that example. We've seen other people, and then I think we can be an example. Okay, be an example to others. Just like they were an example to you. There's a poem. I, I, I first actually heard this from a coach uh, when I was in high school playing football. And they read this this poem to us before a playoff game. And uh, for some reason, I always remembered it. But the author's unknown. But I wanted to read that to you. There are little eyes upon you as they're watching night and day. There are little ears that quickly take in every word you say. There are little hands all eager to do anything you do. And a little boy who's dreaming of the day he'll be like you. You're the little fellow's idol. You're the wisest of the wise. In his little mind about you, no suspicions ever rise. 
He believes in you devoutly, holds all you say and do. He will, he will say and do in your way when he's grown up just like you. There's a wide-eyed little fellow who believes you're always right, and his eyes are always open, and he watches day and night. You're setting an example every day in all you do for the little boy who's waiting to grow up to be just like you. And I think we can apply this to living out our faith. People are watching us. What, even when we don't realize it, okay, that, that there's people. They see how you respond at school. They, they see how you um, respond at work. You know, do, what's it look like? How, what's your faith look like? You know, are they going to see a faith that is alive and active? Or are they going to see that, that we're any different from the world around us? You know, how will others see you living out your faith? What does it look like for you? Be an example to others. Okay, so here we go. All right, 2019. What's your action going to be? You know, we come into this time and we're tempted to make a bunch of New Year's resolutions, right? And, you know, we're going to exercise more, we're going to eat better and, and, and travel more, whatever, blah, 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 right? And in a couple of weeks, it'll be like, oh, man, that's too tough, I'm not doing that. Um, I would challenge us to make some, some spiritual commitments that that may lead to eternal benefits to the world around us. Okay, if we're going to make some changes, yeah, and some of us need, myself included, a need to exercise, a need to, those, it's not those things that aren't important, but in the big picture, if we're really going to try to make some serious commitments, man, spiritual commitments to serving God, wow. One more passage, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Okay, that was written by Paul, same man who said we're saved by grace. So obviously, he's not going against that, right? What he had said. But he's talking about living out our faith. In reverence to God. Listen to that same passage in the message version. What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in response of obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. Okay, he's challenging the people. You guys were doing great. Keep it going. In fact, step it up. How are you going to grow in your faith? So, what area of living out your faith are you guys going to focus on this year? I don't know. I mean, you guys are going to have to decide, but are you going to be more public about your faith? Are you going to to try to build some relationships with non-Christians this year and just love on them? Are you going to you know, find a place to serve at church? Or are you going to really try to grow your roots deeper through you know, prayer and reading God's Word this year? Are you, maybe you need to get back into the game. You've just been a spectator for quite a while. It's time to get back into it. So what, what are you going to do? What, what's your action going to be? So there's a card. And you, some of you have probably seen it already. Uh, in the seat backs in front of you. Um, so you might need to pass those around a little bit so, so everybody can, can have one of those. And if, if you need to reach behind or in front of you, um, you guys can do that. And, and we're going to have a couple minutes here of just kind of reflection time here in a minute. And... and uh, where I want you to begin to pray about thinking about, okay, God, what, what, what do I need to do this year? What, what, what's an action I need to t- take? And then, then I encourage you to take that card with you when you leave today and, and put that somewhere where you'll see it throughout the year. Well, maybe it's on your mirror. Maybe it's in your car or, or somewhere that it's just going to remind you. So um, a, a good place is not in your Bible where you stick it clear in there and then six months you're like, 
Oh, yeah, there's that card. Uh, what's my action? Yeah, my action was to put it in my Bible. No. Um, so why, why is this so important? You know, why am I talking the best about this? I believe it is giving hands and feet to the gospel message of Jesus. You know, we don't serve God to to make us feel good or, or to puff us up or to you know kind of check our good deed stuff off the list. That's not why we do this. We do these things because Jesus died for us, and and, and when we accept this and decide to, to to follow Him, it's it, it's a blessing to be able to serve Him. It's like uh, what a privilege. That I get to do this. It's not a duty at all. Friends, faith isn't just a noun. It's a verb as well. Is it a verb in your life? So, with these things in mind, let, let's take some time right now, just, just you and God. And pray about your action. If you're ready to write that down in your card, write it down. If you need to take it home with you, do that. But let's go ahead and just spend a little time with God right now. Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for Jesus. And, and I pray that as we, we think about these things today and, and this week and through this year, I, I pray that every one of us will have a faith that is alive. A faith that, that says, I, I, I want to, to be a doer, not just to say, yeah, I believe believe in Jesus I pray that that there will be a kind of a, a Jesus glow to us that people will see hey there's there's something different about this person why are they always helping people why do they do these things help us to, just Jesus to flow out of us Lord we love you so much it's in your name we pray amen this morning we're going to kind of change things up a little bit. We're going to go right into a time of communion here uh, before we even sing a song. And, um, you know, when you're thinking about Jesus, you think about action, right? You think about the action of the cross. And, and, and you see Jesus and what He did, and He willingly went to the cross. You guys realize that, right? It, it wasn't like they, oh, they forced Him into this. He could have stopped it at any time. And if you think back to the, the night Jesus was arrested, uh, the soldiers came to, to get him when he was in the garden with his disciples. They came to arrest him. And, and, and remember, Peter pulled out his sword and he cut off the ear of the um, servant of the high priest. And, and Jesus said, no, hey, that's not why we're here. He, he healed that ear. 
and I wanted to read about that. Um, it says, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for, for all who draw the sword will draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and we will at once, he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Okay, do you really think about that? Jesus could have stopped this any time. But he didn't. And he went on to be crucified. Talk about the ultimate action. And this morning, as we take the Lord's Supper, we're, we're going to do it a little differently. The, the men are going to, to pass out the bread and the juice, and, and we're going to just hold on to it and, and take it together once everyone has received it. So um, let me say that just one more time. We're, we're, we'll uh, pass out the bread and the juice, and, and when you receive it, just hang on to it, and then, and then I'll kind of lead us through a time of taking that together. Um, and so let, let's, uh, let's be focusing on the action of Jesus as they do that. The music will play in the background. Guys, you can go ahead and start passing that out. <laughs> 